little breezy at my house last night. Not sure if anybody else had that situation, um, but uh, glad to see that you're all here and hopefully uh, relatively little damage. We are starting a new series today uh, out of the, the book of First Peter. And in thinking about the introduction to that, I was thinking about the fact that um, my family and I are in the final stages of a vacation planning. And um, we are going to take a trip this spring, and we're going to go to Europe. And uh, we've never been. Uh, nobody in our group has ever been. My son spent about 12 hours on a layover in London. That's all. That's our total experience. Uh, but our, our kids are going with us. And with something I've wanted to do for a long time, we've been planning it for a couple of years, talking about it, budgeting for it. We targeted a time. And then we did what you start to do, right? We started to make arrangements. We, we looked at plane tickets. We bought plane tickets, decided where we wanted to go. We started looking at accommodations. And you get online and you look at pictures and you read reviews. And then you hope that the pictures look something like where you end up and you, you do the best job that you can. Right. And in our case, we're going to go to London and and we're going to spend some time there. And then we're going to go to France, but in France, we're going to meet up with my niece who married a Frenchman. And so they have been helping us with accommodations and what we're going to do. And there we're going to rent a car because I'm going to let him drive and uh, he can read the signs. So I thought that would be a plus. Um, And they're going to take us to different places. The difference between those two parts of our trip are that in one place, we've never been there. And we're not going with anybody who's ever been there. We're just doing the best we can. So I've been watching a lot of like BBC shows so I can try to pick up the language there in England, you know, because they speak a different language. It's a lot like our language, but it sounds funny. But when we go to France, we're going to have a native there. Someone we know, someone we trust, someone who can guide us on what to see, what to do, how to have the best experience we can. Peter is writing to Christians, and he's talking to them about eternal things. Now, Peter had never been to heaven, right? He didn't, Paul had a vision of heaven. Peter doesn't record that, but Peter had been with Jesus, He'd spent time with Jesus. He actually got to see Jesus in his heavenly form, his glorified state. Jesus came from heaven. He was going to heaven. Peter is empowered by the Holy Spirit, and he he's uh, writing, and he's letting people know about what they can expect. And so we're going to get into some of the details of 1 Peter as we go through, but I just want to begin by reading the first two verses of this book. First Peter chapter one, verse one. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. And so we see a couple of things here. First of all, we see the author of the letter. Now, you probably already knew that because in your Bible it says 1 Peter. But Peter tells us who's writing it, right? He says, it's me, Peter. He's writing this letter probably in the early A.D. 60s. So uh, scholars tell us maybe 62 A.D., which is significant. He's probably writing from Rome. We'll talk about that as we go through. In A.D. 64, Paul would be martyred at Rome, the Apostle Paul. 
And then depending on who you read, 66, 68 was when Peter would have been killed. And so this is towards the end of Peter's life. He doesn't necessarily maybe know that, but he knows that difficult days are here and they're coming. And in the middle of that, he's he's writing this book and he says, more and more grace and peace. He, he, He tells us who he's writing to. He says, I'm writing in verse one to God's chosen people living as foreigners. And then he names these provinces. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, if you're like me, the only name you even recognize there is Asia, and he's not referring to Asia like you think Asia. Because all of those were provinces in what we would call Asia Minor. And if you want to throw that map up there, Dale, that'll kind of show us a little bit. Um, All of those are in modern-day Turkey. So, it's a little hard to see, but in the in the smaller letters there, it's Asia, it's it's Pontus, it's it's Galatia, it's these places, all of them in modern day Turkey. This was an area where the Apostle Paul was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go and preach. And there's no record that Peter traveled here, although he may have. But there were. Christians on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem who were from areas near here. And so we don't know exactly how these churches started, but we know that there's believers, followers of Jesus Christ in these areas, and Paul sends them a letter. And he says at the end of verse number two, May God give you more and more grace and peace. Now, as we're going to see, he doesn't say, may you live in peaceful times. Because they were not living, nor were they going to be living in peaceful times. What he says is, may God give you more and more grace and peace. He goes on and verse 3 and 4 and says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. So he talks about being born again. Now, I want us to go back and and read again verse 2 as we begin to look at this. He says, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his Spirit made you holy. Now, when we start reading verses like that, that sometimes can get us a little uncomfortable, right? Because we start talking about issues of like, foreknowledge or predestination or Calvinism. And some of you just at the mention of those words went, whoa, where are we going? But we want to look at the language that Peter uses. And, and, and what we want to do is we want to base what we know and what we believe on God's word. Amen? Now, see, some of you don't trust me because you were like, Hey, man, I mean, probably, but what are you going to say? What are you going to do? Where are we going? We want to look at the language that Peter uses. He said, God knew you. God had a plan. And God desires to save you. And through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, he made you holy. And then he says in verse number three, he says, all praise because it is his great mercy that we have been born again. Here, Peter is using the same language that Jesus used in John chapter 3 when the rich young ruler came to him, Nicodemus, and he said to him, you must be born again. You remember that interaction, right? And the guy said, what, am I, you know, am I to enter into my mother's womb? But he said, no, what's flesh is flesh, but what's spirit is spirit. He was talking about a spiritual birth. 
And Peter said, listen, it's God's mercy that has allowed this to happen. I want you to see what he says here in verse number three. He says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. So whose great mercy? The Father's, right? The God the Father is at work in our salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, says, All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in our eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who who belong to his dear son. Now, here's what happens. We read a verse like that. That, that before the foundations of the world, before we were born, God knew us and God chose us. And then we apply our logic to things like that. We say, well, if God chose us, then we must not make a choice. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say we don't have a choice. The Bible says God chose us. You say, well, if God chose us, then how do we have a choice, preacher? Well, Romans says that our salvation is a mystery. It also, the Bible is very clear that sometimes the way we think is not exactly the way God thinks. We're going to see that in just a moment when we start talking about trials and tribulations and how God looks at those versus how we look at those. But God knew us. And he chose us. And yet, as we will see, even in this passage, we still have a part to play. But the Father's mercy and glory is part of our salvation. And then he says, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, the the Son, obviously, is at work as well. Because God raised Jesus from the dead, now we live with great expectation. See, the, 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 the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all working together to bring us, make us born again into the family of God. Second Thessalonians talks about it this way, beginning in, in 2 Thessalonians 2.13. As for us, we can't help but thank God for you, dear brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. We are always thankful that God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation, a salvation that came through the Spirit who makes you holy and through your belief in the truth. He called you to salvation when we are told when we told you the good news. Now you can share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So even here it says, God chose you, but then it said the Spirit worked in your belief. And so there's an element in the fact that we have to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and yet God knows us, loves us, and has chosen us. You say, well, how do those two things work together? It's got to be God's will or ours will. Well, that's the way we think about things. But God sees things in a different way. I don't have to fully understand everything. What I have to do is trust what the Holy Scriptures say. And so the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are working together to bring about our salvation. We're going to see all throughout this book, but even in this chapter, Peter talks about it, our, our salvation, both in present tense and in future tense. He talks about things that are now, but also things to come. He says, we already read it, but he says that we are made holy. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Because here on this earth, we are not holy. And yet God, when he looks at us, sees the holiness of Jesus Christ. We talked about that last week. 
And then he's going to talk about bringing about our salvation in the future. We'll see that here in a moment. But first, I want us to look at verse number four. He says, we live at the end of verse three with great expectation. Some versions talk about we live with a blessed hope. This idea of what is coming is going to be great. And then he says in verse number four, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Now, I think it was last night. I don't know. I didn't buy a ticket, but I saw that the Powerball, one of the lotteries was like over a billion dollars again. Was it last night? Who wants to confess they bought a ticket? Nobody. (laughs) Some of you did. I know you did. It's okay. As long as you tithe, I'm for you winning. I pray for that. Imagine if you won a billion dollars. And they I saw a little news story and they were interviewing people. You know, and, and one guy, one guy's like, Oh, I would uh, you know, I'd buy a I'd buy a house with a pool or I'd do this or I'd do that. And uh, they interviewed like a teenager and he was like, you know, I'd buy I'd snacks or he said something kind of goofy. I was like, well, yeah, so you can do a lot with a billion dollars, you know. You figure it out. And then imagine if your parents won a billion dollars and that was your inheritance. Now, I got an inheritance one time. My grandmother died and she gave a part of what uh, what she had to her grandkids. It was pretty cool. It, it wasn't life-changing money, but it was just cool to get an inheritance. But Peter says, we have a great inheritance, and it's secure for us in heaven. He says that it's priceless, that it's eternal. Romans says this, Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 says, For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And as we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing to be compared to the glory he will reveal in us later. It says we are heirs, and we are heirs to God's glory. God, when we talk about great expectation, God has prepared for us a rich and an eternal inheritance, something that cannot be taken away, that a downturn in the market, Jesus Christ would say, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where thieves can't break in and steal it, where, where moths don't and, and rust doesn't corrupt it, where it's going to be eternally safe and secure. This is what God has for us. But in Romans, he says, if we're heirs to his glory, we're also heirs to his suffering. And wouldn't you know it, Peter talks about that as well. 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 5, goes on and says, and through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive his salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. This is an interesting verse. See, at first he said that God knew us and God chose us, but now he says that our faith is at work and that our salvation is in the future. He called us holy, but what he says is our salvation is going to be revealed. See, as Christians, we're to show Jesus Christ on this earth, right? We're to be salt. We're to be light. Jesus said a city on a hill can't be hidden. Uh, We talk about being the hands and feet of Jesus. We talk about showing and sharing the love of God to others. But at times we fail to do that. Amen? Right? As Christians, we're not perfect in doing that. 
And even when we try to do that, sometimes it doesn't work out the way we, we hoped it would. Right? You ever try to do that? Try to try to do something nice for somebody or you, you try to have a good attitude in a situation that just doesn't seem to go the way you want. And so as followers of Jesus, we are to be light in this world. We are to be salt in this world. But what Peter tells us, what he gives us a glimpse of is that our salvation will be revealed in the last day. You ever think about what that's going to look like? What our eternal state is going to be? Where, where we will, I, the Bible says that our corruption will put on incorruption, our mortality will put on immortality. I can't imagine me in that type of state. I think about it. Sometimes I sit and try to meditate on it, and I'm like, well, wait, what would that be? Because my back kind of kind of aches a little bit all the time. And I've got a knee that sort of just has a, a dull throbbing pretty much all the time. And you're telling me physically those things are going to go away? Plus, man, I have thoughts sometimes. My first thought isn't always a godly thought, you know? You look at a situation and maybe you judge or you're judgmental. You say, preacher, I can't believe you're that way. I, I'm not that way at all. Well, God bless you, but just telling you. And, and our salvation, our inheritance, the glory of God will be revealed in us. What an amazing thing that will be. And he says that God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation. Then he goes on in verse number six. He says, so be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead and we should end right there. but we're not going to. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you must trust him, or you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. So verse five there talks about that we are being kept by God's power until the day when our salvation will be revealed. And he, and he says in verse six, listen, You can look forward with great joy. But then he says, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Now, that word many doesn't necessarily mean a bunch of trials. That's when we, when you read that, that's what you think. But actually, the root of that is more of the idea of a variety of trials. See, Peter is writing probably from Rome. The emperor, the Caesar at that time is Nero. But after, and Nero did some horrible things to Christians, but after Nero, we're going to have a couple of Caesars that are really going to go after Christians, where where persecution of Christians is going to be the official policy of the Roman Empire. And depending on where you live will depend upon how much persecution comes your way. Paul's writing to these these believers in Asia Minor, some of the persecution might have been less there than it was in Rome. And I think about the uncertainty of this, of the writing of this letter. Persecution had come 
kind of. Stephen had been martyred right in the book of Acts, right? One of the first deacons. Others have been killed for their faith. But Peter's still alive. He's writing. Other apostles were, were preaching, and some were being persecuted, but some were having great success. And there was a lot of uncertainty in the world, kind of like right now, isn't it? I mean, we live in the United States of America, and we still have incredible freedom. Now, I know that if you want to find something to get fired up about, you can go on Facebook and somebody somewhere will tell you somebody that's plotting to, you know, overthrow, uh, find all Christians and round them up and uh, whatever. And some of that might be real and some of it might not be. But in general, when you guys got up this morning and you made the decision to come to church, one of the the things that you were thinking about wasn't, man, do you think I might get arrested? Most of you were probably thinking about, you know, am, am I going to have time to get the kids ready and get breakfast before I come? If we're running a little late, will there still be enough donuts? Do I have power this morning? That was an issue, right, for some of you? But from, I doubt any of us went, Man, you think I'll get arrested? Do you think the police will 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 knock in the doors and round us up and take us to jail for gathering to worship Jesus this morning? No, that we don't have to fear that. There are believers in other countries who do have that thought when they get up together on Sunday mornings. They, they have different times that they've got to come to where they're gathering because if they all came at once, that would draw too much attention. And they know that every time they gather together, there is a risk that persecution from government authorities might come. Now, that's not to say that we don't have some obstacles in our world today. I believe our society, our country, is certainly less friendly and inclined to Christianity than it has been in the past. And it, it varies quite a bit. Some of you may work in environments where it's just kind of neutral, whatever. Some of you may work in environments where there's, there's Christians around you and it's a pretty good place to, to be. Others of you may feel like you're the only Christian and it's really kind of hostile towards you. I talk to believers in, in Denver who tell me that they didn't get a promotion because they're a Christian. And that's not something they think, like that's something that's documented. But it's like, well, we can't promote this person because their values don't align with the values that we have as a company. And so there's a variety of persecution. There's a variety of trials. For some of you, even in your own family, you are struggling and dealing with some issues that are very difficult. And so we have to endure many or a variety of trials. Not only that, but the trials are to bring purification. These trials will show, verse 7, that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. As fire comes and melts gold and the impurities rise to the top and are removed so that the gold is more pure, trials that we endure, part of that is to purify our faith. It's to make it better, stronger, more real. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. It's to bring glory to God. I was thinking about that. And I was thinking about how we, we celebrate glory and we celebrate different accomplishments. 
you know, we're in the middle of March Madness, and I think the the women's championship games today. Is that right? Somebody help me. I didn't watch it. And uh, the men's is tomorrow, and they'll, you know, the winner, they'll have confetti, and they'll play a song, and they'll be like slow motion pictures, you know, all of that. There'll be a trophy presentation. And people will talk about, oh, this is so great. We'll remember this forever. And some people will remember it. And then if I said to you, you know, who won the college men's basketball national championship five years ago, some of you would be like, you can spout that off. And others would be like, I don't have the first clue. Because sometimes glory fades away. In sports, that's the case. I used to coach high school football, and one time I was handing out jerseys. I think I've told this story before, but I handed a kid. He was a running back, and I handed him 34. And I said, man, that's Walter Payton's number. And he said, who? And so I hit him. I mean, I, I, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But when I was a kid, that was like the epitome of the greatest running back ever. And then a generation later, it was like, who's that? Last November, my wife and I went to uh, Empower Field, the Broncos Stadium, and we watched the Air Force Academy play uh, the play Army, play the West Point uh, Army team. And it was very cool. Uh, they, I mean, they had parachutists coming in and flyovers, and there's cadets there, and very patriotic. And I, I'm not prone to a lot of emotionalism, but I like those things kind of, you know, little awesome leaked out of my eyes. You know what I'm saying? And at halftime of that game, one of the, the the most incredible things I've ever seen took place. There was a gentleman there by the name of James Harvey III. He's the gentleman on the left there, the, the older guy that's hunched over. This is a picture from that day, November 4th, 2023. He's 100 years old. He's one of the original Tuskegee Airmen. He lives right here in Lakewood. He was given an honorary promotion to full colonel. On the far right there is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Charles Brown Jr. His daughter and his niece pinned the, the emblems on him, and they did a flyover of some of the planes that he had flown in. He was a part of the 1949 competition among with propeller planes where the Tuskegee Airmen won this Top Gun competition. He was a part of that. He was the first African-American to fly a jet in a combat mission in Korea. But on that day in November... He hadn't really been in the military for like 50 years. I mean, the truth is, the guy was 100. He's not flying anything now. But he's worthy of our honor, is he not? I am not ashamed to tell you that as I sat there and they showed it on the screen and they talked about it, and I'm just kind of like, that is awesome. People are like, you have indigestion? I'm like, you know. Those things get me worked up. Imagine what it's going to be when we stand before God Almighty and he bestows upon us in a physical form his righteousness and his glory. When we are given crowns with jewels based on trials and sufferings that we've endured, and we are able 
to, to offer those back as, a, as an offering to our Savior and our Lord. That is a, a glory that will not fade away. Somewhere in a box in my shop is a VHS tape, and on that is some film from a football, from some football games when I was in high school. That glory has long faded away. No, but I'm not even interested in watching that. If I brought that out and made my kids watch it, it would be torture to them. Oh, but there'll be a day when we will be crowned with glory that will never fade. And so when he says trials and difficulties are coming, no wonder he could say we face those things with great expectations. We face those things with hope and joy. Notice what he says there, verse number eight. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Notice again, he's talking about our faith, that our faith is at work with God's foreknowledge and choosing of us. The reward for trusting him, verse nine, will be the salvation of your souls. You say, well, so is our soul not saved? Of course it is. Paul's already, or Peter's already called us holy, but it hasn't been revealed. We haven't fully seen it, but it's coming, and the power of God is keeping it secure for that day. It was interesting as I read about the Tuskegee Airmen. They had this competition in 1949, and they won, but the they didn't recognize them as winners because it was an all African American unit. It was decades later before they finally were acknowledged as the winners of these competition. Some of those men probably died never having received that acknowledgement, but our glory is secure. Our glory is being kept by the father. Our glory will not, fade away. I want to close with two verses this morning. First Peter 1, 10, and 12, 10 through 12, that's three, sorry. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about the gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterwards. He says, listen, the prophets, they prophesied about the Messiah. They prophesied about what would come, but they didn't fully understand it. Verse 12 goes on and says, they were told that their, that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preach in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Peter says the Old Testament prophets and the angels now are looking down in amazement at what God is doing in us. Because what God did was he took Jews and Gentiles, he took people and by their faith and his, his knowledge, he created the church not an institution, but a group of people empowered and indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God to do amazing things on this earth. Not because we're amazing, but because we serve an amazing God. And even that plan has not been fully revealed. Ephesians chapter three says this, as you read what I have written, verse four, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. 
God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessing because they belong to Christ Jesus. The thing I love about that verse is it says God has a plan. Just like that first church endured trials. Predominantly under, first under Jewish attack by the Jewish leaders, that's what, those are those who killed Jesus. And then the entire Roman Empire for a while, that was their policy. But God had a plan. You know, God, one of the things that God did was he, because people fled persecution, uh, believers of Jesus began to, to leave first Jerusalem and other areas. And as they spread, they still talked about their belief in Jesus and, and the gospel spread at a rapid rate because of persecution. God had a plan. And we don't know what the future is. And I think one of the biggest things that Satan is at work doing right now, and you see it in our society, is the fear of the unknown. And I know I say I don't like to talk about politics, and then I always talk about politics. Do you notice that? No? Okay. But, man, if you're a supporter of Joe Biden, what you hear is, man, if Trump gets elected, it's going to be horrible. And if you're a supporter of Trump, what you hear about Joe Biden is, if Joe Biden gets elected, we can't afford it. And it's the fear of the unknown. And people play to our fears. And here's the thing. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what the future holds politically, economically, spiritually. I don't know what my future holds health-wise. There are a million questions that I might have about the future, but I know the one who knows the future. And God has a plan. And my security is not in a 401k or, or in a savings account or in a political party, or in my plans. My security is in an inheritance that is rich and is eternal and it's beyond thievery or corruption. And it must be in heaven because nothing in this world is beyond thievery or corruption. Amen? And so I can live with joy and peace in the middle of darkness and chaos and trials because my security is in God Almighty. And even the Old Testament prophets and the angels look in wonder at what God is doing for us. But he only does that for his children. Those who have put their faith and trust in him, those who have been born again. And my challenge to you, my encouragement to you, is do you know Jesus Christ? And if you do, are you trusting in his plan? Are you focused on him? Ephesians, we'll close with this verse. Ephesians chapter 3, we've read several verses out of there, but 10 and 11 says this. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Notice what he's talking about there to all the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. He's talking about spiritual beings. That God is using his church as a testimony to spiritual beings. And then he says, this was his eternal plan. 
which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We do not know what the future holds. We do not know what's going to happen next, next week, tomorrow, even this afternoon. But God has a plan, and we are part of it. We can trust in him. We need to trust in him because as we go in, as we go to our jobs, as we interact with our family, we're going to be dealing with people who are living in uncertainty and with fear. And God has given us grace and peace. And it's that grace and peace that can be a testimony, not just to unsaved, unseen spiritual beings, but to men and women in our families, at our jobs, our neighbors. And so if you're here this morning and you know Christ is your Savior, know that God has a plan. I don't fully know what it is, but I know we can trust in him. Let's pray this morning. God, Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. God, I thank you for this letter that Peter wrote some 2,000 years ago at a time when followers of you were uncertain about the future and about the things happening, but he wrote to give some spiritual insight that is still beneficial to us today. It's been beneficial for believers down through the ages, and it will be beneficial to believers in the future until you come. God, I pray that you would help us to trust in you, to walk in that faith. Lord, if there's somebody here this morning that does not know you as Savior, I pray, God, that today would be that day that they would seek out myself or somebody that that they know and trust to, to, to help them to know how they can know Jesus Christ, how they can experience his holiness his righteousness, his glory in their life. And God, help us as believers to walk in that glory and that righteousness even this week. In your son's precious and powerful name we pray. Amen.